Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here this evening. It is a very special night for us tonight here at um, Adverse. This is our fifth edition of Verse Solos, and with no other than William Mapan, who's just come in from Paris. Uh, we're very, very honored. And um, this evening is, is very special because I've got a power panel. I've got two exquisite and distinguished curators um, on the panel with me tonight. Um, I've got on the, so thank you very much for being here and making the time. I've got on the very right, um, I've got Tamar Clark Brown, um, who is a London based curator, artist, and writer. She produces and curates projects with art technology teams at the Serpentine Galleries. And her work is around futurisms, technologies, and diasporic uh, practices. Tamar is one of the uh, Days 100 individuals 2022, and she's worked with a number of institutions, including um, Autograph, the ICA, South London Gallery, Tate Gallery, Yale School of Art, Somerset House, uh, Bart, and many, many more. And I've got right next to Tamar, I've got Melanie Lenz. And Melanie is the curator of digital art at the Victoria Albert Museum. She's got over 20 years of experience of curating, commissioning, and del delivering creative projects. Melanie um, specializes in digital arts and culture, having curated, co-curated, uh, Chance and Control, Art in the Age of Computers from 20 that took place in 2018, 2019. And she's published a number of papers on early computer art in Latin America and gender and technology and collecting and conserving digital art. Uh, Melanie is also one of the judges for the Lumen Prize um, this year. So thanks very much for being here. Um, I don't feel like William needs much introduction, actually. Um, I think everybody is here probably for William. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> and for the wine, uh, William and wine, great combination. Um, but William is, um, for those who are not familiar, is an artist who's predominantly known um, for his generative practice. Um, but William is an artist who works actually across a number of different mediums. Um, he's most well known for a number of um, series such as Dragons, Anticyclone, and most recently, Solitude. Um, it, it feels, yeah, just very special having you here for this particular series, um, William, because I feel like this series called um, the exhibition you entitled it Intimacy, and it feels like this series is such a departure point for you. It feels quite different to everything else. While you've kind of looked at textures in your work and color explorations, it does feel like there's something else going on. And actually, in your own words, you once said on one of our calls, you feel like you've cracked your own code, and that really struck with me. So I was wondering if, to kick off the conversation, you could just give us all an overview of what the exhibition is about and what works it entails. Sure. Um, thank you for coming, everyone. Hi. Um, can you hear me? That's cool? Yeah? OK. Uh, yeah, intimacy, I think I just wanted you to get closer to me um, and, and for you to know how I start stuff, how I start my ideas, how I start piece of art, uh, my sketches, and especially my sketchbook, uh, because this is usually the starting point, my sketchbook. And I really wanted to have this proximity with, with people with, and with me, especially because I sketch a lot on my free time. Well, now it's my full time job, so uh, my daily life, I sketch a lot. Daily practice. Daily practice. Um, and I want, and I, and I want a, a way for me, because it's a way of expressing for, my, for me, it's a way to express myself, to sketch, to draw some stuff on my sketchbook, and I wanted to expand on that, to make it generative like with a system, um, because I'm very limited as a human, as all of us, we are limited with our hands, brain, body, um, and having a system just is a way for me to go way further than I could physically, and I wanted to find a way to, yeah, to crack my code to how how do I think, like with my intuition, 
so for months and months, I was only in my sketchbook, drawing nonsense stuff. And at some point, I'm like, oh, every time I start a shape, I start there. And the next one, I start there. And then the stroke goes like this. Like, oh, maybe I should, I could now maybe translate this to coding, make a system out of it. And yeah, that's how the Sketchbook A series were born. So it's like one year, I think more like 18 months work in progress already. Uh, so it's a deep dive into my practice and I wanted to share that with you, which this is the, the title of the show, Intimacy, to get closer with me. And the other one, uh, Through Your Eyes, which is displaying here, is a way, it's, it's how I, I was seeing what the algorithm was spitting at me. Like, like through your eyes, actually through your eyes of the machine or the algorithm. So it's more about what I see through you, through you who I made actually, you're my child, but I don't fully understand what I do and sometimes things pop up like these ones. Uh, and I'm fascinated by how the brain can associate facial features. Oh, I see a nose, I see eyes, I see a mouth. And yeah, and I wanted for this series to be on the other side of, 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 of the spectrum where sometimes I can go very texture, uh, you know, painterly, crayony, like, like um, sketchbook A, but on this one I wanted to go the other way where I use digital brush stroke, but still when you look far away, you feel a sense of depth and, and sensibility. So that's what I wanted to, to express with all that. Yeah. What was, the, what was the drive to kind of imitate the human hand so much in these pieces? What, what because um, that makes it very distinct to your other work, I guess. I think it's not about imitating the texture. It's about imitating my way of putting a line on my sketchbook. And as I was saying to, to some people earlier, it's not about what the texture looks like. It's about what the broad stroke looks like and what it means. It, does it mean out of pressure, what mood are you in? So I was very really analyzing myself when making this series, like when I'm hungry, angry, not hungry works too. <laughs> how, how hard do I press the sketchbook if you know, uh, I'm happy, if I'm tired, I'm gonna lift the, my, my wrist often. often. Mm -hmm. And I wanted all these components of humanity to go to my algorithm. And it translates as it was uh, like a crayon. But I, I think this, this is just how we see it because there is nothing crayon -y. I don't have like, oh yeah, this is crayon A, you know, uh, in my algorithm. It's all variables and abstract um, concepts. So it's more about how we see it. We see it as crayon because this is what we know. But it's not about that, it's about my, me expressing myself through this and analyzing my way of drawing. It's interesting, so it's almost like you're bringing in the emotional, so you were mentioning when you're hungry, how, how you use the pen when you're hungry on your, on your physical work. And like trying to um, translate that emotion into your digital work. That's, I think that makes complete sense because I, somebody was talking to me about the series and they were like, what, what is it that you love about this series so much? And I thought about it and I thought, actually the thing I really like most about it is that it has soul and it's a very hard thing to capture in something that is created with an algorithm because very often I feel left, like I'm stimulated by the imagery, I'm stimulated by the concept, but something is still quite soulless. There's a certain flatness about it. and. For me, this series is doing like exactly the opposite. It's, it's, it's carrying that emotion. So I never knew that you think about these things when you're doing it, but it definitely comes through. Um, Tamar and Melanie, I mean, 
experts <laughs> in the field. And for me, it's really yeah fascinating to hear how you both respond individually to this series and also where you see it um, sit in the wider narrative of contemporary art. Because I know that's very much part of your job, um, working with institutions that you need to see the work in the wider narrative. So, I don't know, Melanie, if you want to um, start. Maybe I'll kick off by saying so my interest is very much in contemporary practices, but I work with a um, predominantly historic and early collection. So very interested in those exploratory experimental practices of early practitioners um, seeking to at times almost like codify the act of drawing, seeing what's possible through doing their own sketches and thinking about how to like, yeah, create a code that um, does something very similar and through that also expresses emotion um, a lot of the pieces in the V&A collection are very much about computational aesthetics and so don't necessarily have that gestural quality, but that's not the case at all for all the works. In fact, if anything, there is no one digital aesthetic. So a piece that comes to mind immediately is like Vera Molnar's Letters to My Mother. Um, and there is this kind of other reading of it, whether intentional or not. I mean, that also, like she's spoken about it in different ways, but... Um, yeah, I find it really interesting the way that contemporary artists like William do, there is more to the work than just um, the generative process in and of itself, but there is this underlying human aspect, which I think sometimes gets mis, or we don't necessarily think about in terms of digital. So I think it is interesting to contextualize it with, although not obviously direct comparison, but there is this history of different ways of thinking about engaging with generative um, and digital artworks. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that because you were saying this earlier, William, about that so much of your work is about your relationship also, the human relationship with the computer, and that seems to be historically what artists have been continually, that, that dialogue, you know, that, that dialogue between the human and the machine seems to be an ongoing... I mean, it's very true if we think about artists like Carol Cohn, and he spent his whole life working with one program and thinking about his... Um, practice beforehand, which was as a painter, um, and then when he started working with code, he continued working. I mean, Aaron was actually like a series of softwares, but he continued working with it for a long time about developing it and his relationship with it as a collaborator. And so, yeah, these relationships go very, are very deep. What, why do you think they exist? Why do you think artists have that fascination or like intention of figuring this out? You know, the, the relationship with the machine. Um, I mean, I, mean, I could defer to the artist, but I think it's like, yeah, ongoing exploratory practices, always like questioning. And I mean, maybe it's different for everyone. I don't know if I can specifically say there's one reason why people are always fascinated by this. I don't know if you want to jump in. I just want to talk about, I suppose, a practice of coming into relation with um, and of course, you know, computational practice and all of these things have a long history, but also, you know, from the time that one of the reasons I kind of got into this field and was really interested was kind of trying to find that intimacy, I suppose, with digital practices, with technologies. Um, and I think, you know, increasingly artists, are, we've kind of got to a point where I think artists are still investigating, I suppose, like the... Um, uh, the construct and the materiality of the infrastructures themselves, but also trying to figure out what that means in their continuing becoming in the world as well. I think that like personal narratives and things like that are starting to enter this space a lot more, which is what interests me personally. Um, because that is, you know, yes, we can talk about the machine, yes, we can talk about these things, but at the end of the day, we're all some kind of organism, I'm not going to say human, don't know how everyone <laughs> identifies. <laughs> but, you know, I think it is increasingly about how do we come into relation with these things that are shaping our world, the infrastructures are shaping our world, and how can we, you know, continue to kind of interrogate the infrastructures. I think I heard you talking a lot about, and what I see a lot is kind of you, you're talking about cracking your own code, but it's also about, I suppose, I don't know, like a kind of cartographic tracking of your own movement or expanse of your own movement potential or your own expressive potential, I suppose, within a space or an infrastructure or a code that you've set up. And I think at the end of the day, we're all trying to, you know, crack our own codes or crack society's codes or, um, yeah. So I think for me, it's a very, uh, they're very tactile works, which is exactly what I'm excited about. 
um, in your practice and kind of going forward in the space as well. Yeah, it's interesting that you picked up on that, Tamar, because that's what you were saying exactly earlier, that it is, it is like almost a journaling for you, this these series of work, and that you want people to go on that journey with you in, her, in terms of that's, you used a really nice sentence, like in terms of the tracking of how your line and how your drawing evolves. So it's nice that that's come together. Um, I think we're at a really interesting time right now where we are so much more aware of digital art in general. Um, there's a lot more talk about it. There's a lot more movement about it. I mean, look, we, you know, William is really just practicing as an artist not for that many years and um, you know we're excited to have him here and his, he's grown very quickly. Um, it does feel though, even though there's been increasing attention on digital art, um, it does feel like there's still quite a separation between artists that are practicing you know, with a digital medium and artists that are quote unquote practicing more in traditional medium. I'm interested to hear from you Tamar because you obviously the Serpentine runs almost two programs. You've got a quote unquote, I don't actually know what to call it, but a traditional program where you're working with a number of um, established gallery, uh, artists who have gallery representation and, you know, museum representation, etc., etc., and you're giving them, a, you know, an incredible exhibition. But you also have this other program that you're working on, the arts and technology, and I'm and I, and I really would love to know, do you feel like your audiences are different? Do you feel like they're overlapping? Is there different kinds of interest in these two and, and yeah? I mean, I think increasingly, essentially, uh, a couple of years ago, we kind of restructured Serpentine a little bit in terms of, um, you know, looking at the key things that we wanted to focus on going forward. And those were civic practice, technologies, ecologies. Um, and one thing I'm definitely, no, those, those are the main things, yeah. Um, and for us, you know, the Arts Technologies Programme, it's a very unique prospect in that we are within an, a traditional arts institution in a sense. Uh, I think Serpentine is always known for, you know, we have an artistic director that likes to ask artists what their unrealised projects are. And we're always kind of been, I suppose, trained in that sense to think about the impossible to, you know, it's a commissioning institution as well, first and f kind of first and foremost. Um, and for us, it's really about how to, you know, we within Arts Technologies are in quite a unique position in that we have kind of been, or tasked ourselves, I should say, actually, with kind of looking at the different ways in which artists working with technologies are changing the ecosystem. So, for example, we have a publication series called Future Art Ecosystems that um, we're on our third one now. The fourth one will be released next year. And each of those kind of, you know, we do a lot of interviews with different practitioners in the space. The first was looking at art times art and technology, you know, what are practitioners that, that look in this, work in this space, what do they need, what are the different kind of setups, you know, is it about teams, is it about IP, is it about uh, better legal structures for them. Um, the second one was about art and the metaverse, so looking at artists working with gaming. And the third one recently was art and decentralised uh, technology. So for us, we really try to think about how, and what we've seen recently actually is that through these publications, the wider institution has been taking note of like how can we actually uh, adopt these learnings and implement them into the wider uh, the wider working of the institution. So, for example, something like um, something we coined called the UX of art, which looks especially at you know how audiences are interacting with art and how that can instead kind of lead where we go next. Whether or not that's you know developing. I don't know, a Twitch channel that allows artists and, and our audiences to, to get involved in the conversation in a new way, or whether or not that's developing a video game, which is the exhibition we have on at the moment that also has um, the capacity for people to make Web3 tokens. How can our audiences and how can we kind of get into a closer relationship with the people that are experiencing art, but also knowing that there is such a great capacity for people that want to become intimate with these things and how can we, you know, as an artist-led institution, let the artists lead the way in those conversations and shape how technology and how um, institutions in the cultural sector are working with technology towards more civic and social practice. Yeah, I think you guys are quite actually unusual in that sense because it is great. And you were saying that you draw in a lot of young audiences that way. But traditionally and historically, uh, Melanie, a lot of these artists um, practicing um, digital art were always on the periphery of the main art stream. Why is that? Why do you think there's always been this sort of from the art world, well, you work with technology, so you're not part of the mainstream. What I is guess originally, or like initially, um, 
early practitioners were stigmatized because the computer was very much associated with its militaristic origins. And so um, artists like um, Manfred Moore would call people like literally throwing eggs at him and saying, you know, like, you're destroying art because you're using this um, machine medium, which is effectively something that has been used for great destructive purposes. Um, I think there's always been two very distinct views. Either technology will save us, it will kill us. Like this is kind of permeates mm. through lots of society where we're really enthusiastic or like, you know, petrified of it. So certainly early practitioners when technology itself, and this is a time when obviously we're talking about mainframe computers uh, and like very big um, machines that were associated with like industry or laboratories um, and they weren't as commonplace as they are today and they fill people with fear if we look at like popular culture and science fiction computers were always seen as kind of these scary other non-human mm. entities so a lot of the critical reception that artists face you because they use these um, devices were sort of associated with that that it was cold it was impersonal and i think it also comes down to this idea um about the human hand and this idea of the individual genius versus something where you make something with an algorithm and you see the degree of control and questions about creative authority and um, authentic or like what is authentic um, questions that are very much still asked today of contemporary practitioners but I think what is interesting to kind of note that yes it operated outside of the traditional art world there were some exceptions I've mentioned before Manfred Moore and Vera Mona who were fine trained artists but even I mean in their cases sometimes it's not always in those early catalogues emphasized how the works were created. It's just like a print by, and um, it doesn't say how the print was made. But I, I guess the point I wanted to make was that communities still existed. And I guess my question back to you would be like, how important is it that it's in the institute, like institutions accept it for mm. it to be taken forward? Because there was a very active network um, that uh, also arose at the same time in different communities. That's not to say that it wasn't informed by other art movements, op art, um, constructivism, abstract expression. It's like still like it wasn't didn't happen in a vacuum. It was very responsive to the world yeah. around it. But those close knit communities did thrive and continue to thrive, even though they weren't necessarily part of the art world. And I think there are mirrors of that today. I would question how integral is it that it's part? I mean, I'm playing devil's advocate here because I do work for an institution and we do very much want to engage with contemporary practitioners. But putting it like creating this hierarchy, I'm not sure how useful mm. it is. I think both can coexist. Just, um, like, That's a good question. There. <laughs> it's a good question. I guess I personally think it is important because it's a way of us narrating art history. And up to this point, institutions are the only places that are recording the art history. It is quite subjective. And we all know they've made their mistakes, lack of diversity, lack of a lot of things. Um, and we do know that from curator to curator and director to director, their collections um, differ. But if, you know, if nothing is recorded in an institution and we're completely just driven by the market or networks on the on the on the periphery then how can it be recorded and how can a next generation learn from other artists practices so i do think it's important um personally and that's why i mean i've joined verse i was prior at an institution worked independently for a long time but i got excited about the digital art world and to me like in order to make sense of it like my anchor is the art history and i guess this is another question to kind of bring up how important this art history um you know in in, in sort of follow up to your question is is it something that we do need to fall back on um in terms of you know narrating and placing an artist today um that that would be that would be something I'd like to know from both of you as well. I'm gonna, sorry, I'm recently back from Brazil and my, my body's gone into revolt apparently. It's so. like, what? <laughs> okay, I, I will jump in. <laughs> I, I think it's important, not in terms of like, because many people, many new practitioners that I speak to work, create work, not necessarily aware of what's gone before, but I feel like can only enrich and enhance existing practices to kind of, um, be aware of the different um, ways in which people 
have worked um, and sometimes lean into that, but also to th think about differences in the way that they approach things. I mean, obviously, in terms of like culturally and technology, we've moved forward considerably in the, in the last 60 years. So invariably, there will be changes in the way that um, artists think about like different ideas. So yeah, I, I obviously am <laughs> very biased and I think yeah. it's absolutely critical, but I'd be really interested to hear from you, William, your, your yeah. thoughts on this because... Me too, um, because you've been incredibly successful in a very short amount of time how important so you've 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 received recognition you have how important is it for you to receive also that institutional recognition also like does it matter or is it not that important uh, i think it does matter that that institution recognize my work because i want my work to be encoded in art history at some point and it's the institution that does that you know we learn I even learned myself art with books and internet, and what you find is the museum, the galleries, all these very traditional institutions. Uh, that's what makes our culture, and usually subcultures stay subcultures until they're raised by something more mainstream. Um, so for me, it's definitely important to be there, but that's not my end goal. Um, I want to be something forward. I, want, I don't want to be, oh, this guy is doing something like this guy in the past, uh, whatever. I want to be forward, but that I need to, do, to know what was happening before to move forward because I don't want to repeat history. So I need to learn from the past and this comes through the institutions. So I want to be there. Uh, I, will, I always say I want at some point, my son or my grandson to be, oh yeah, you know, William was there in 2022 and doing this, and there was a record. Well, now it was a blockchain, which is something else. But yeah, I want to, I want to trace, basically. I think this is the goal for any artist to have a trace, um, to express yourself and and yeah, and, and to people to hear you. And that goes from it's by institution, I think. But I guess you've also had a lot of, a lot of your kind of support has come from like online communities or, you know. Definitely, definitely my, my first support comes from the online communities, but it doesn't mean I have to stay there. It's, it's a bubble. Mm. I don't like bubbles. I break bubbles. So, I'm going to find, oh, these people don't know me. I'm going to go there. And uh, yeah. But do you think that's part of, mm, I'm not going to say breaking up because I think there's scope for both, but to not, my question is, do you define yourself as a digital artist or do you just define yourself as an artist? Like, I often get yeah. yeah, this, this question. <laughs> um, as an artist and period, because I don't even like the digital label. Yeah. Uh, what does it mean to be a digital artist? Does it, are you defined by your, the tools you're using? Mm -hmm. For me, no. Uh, you just want to express. Don't, don't, you're not linked to tools. So digital artist, traditional, don't make sense. We are all artists. Mm -hmm. uh, I really don't like this label at all. But then that's to answer your question, why have they been separate? But the idea is perhaps that they become one, and we're not making this distinction between like, why has it not been accepted by the art world when we think about it as different, in, as, in, as artists creating works in different ways about different I, I, I also think that there is a huge uh, history load mm -hmm. where people will acknowledge something defined by some set of rules. And sometimes when, if, you're not, if you want to fit in, you're like out of the box because you're, you know, in front of a big wall with people saying, because you're not using oil paint, it's not art. And you're like, no. Mm -hmm. So there is distinction. There is, there is a friction with digital and traditional, but there shouldn't be. I think it's, it's the same. It's very, you know, increasingly a lot of artists that we're working with are doing the same. You know, they'll resubmit their bio and say, can you just take digital out of this, even though that was the, you know, that was the bio when we started working with them. 
I think it's just, you know, similar to how artists in general in culture are wanting to kind of break out of categories and say, hey, I am this person that is multifaceted. Maybe sometimes I work with this, maybe sometimes I work with that, but I can also express in many different ways. And I think it's also just the, I don't know, I suppose just maybe just a comfort. The comfort level has perhaps kind of gone up um, and some of the work, a lot of the work has been done by people like Melanie and, you know, in terms of making that line and making that comfort level um, with the traditional art world, I suppose, that now those walls hopefully are coming down, which can hopefully mean like bigger opportunities, you know, on the digital side or whatever, of course, we have or can, you know, broker certain relationships or have um, certain things we, we offer in terms of coming from the specific side, whether or not that's, you know, having relationships with certain software companies or that kind of thing. And then the, um, I suppose, more traditional, I hate those. I, hate those I know, it's, it's really difficult. hard. <laughs> it's really hard to pull off anything things, else. I suppose, but um, I think it's exciting that the walls, it's always exciting when walls come down. Yeah, I agree though. I agree with William. And I actually, whenever we have team meetings, or I, just, I also don't like calling people digital artists or like we never, you know, I, I just think an artist is an artist. If I'm excited about an artist, I'm excited about the artist. They might work across various mediums as I'm sure you have for, for a long time. I think what has become difficult though, and I, I found this, the, the contextualization of artists that have kind of garnered more attention in the digital space is a little bit hard for me to track. So you were mentioning tracing earlier. So I find that, you know, I actually curious to hear from you, Tamar, because traditionally when you work, especially for a museum or an institution, you kind of look where the artist has exhibited. There's, a, you know, there's quite a linear way of watching. Whereas I have a feeling that you with like, for example, Gabriel Massan, that is like, how do you, how do we all look at art these days? Cause it has changed. Um, that was the main reason why I joined Burst. I felt like my kids didn't really want to go to museums anymore. They're looking at their phone. They're looking at their laptop. So what has changed in terms of us absorbing culture? Um, I think one part of it is just, I guess, I suppose the walls coming down in another sense in terms of, you know, I'm interested in with online communities or whatever, you know, who, who are other people looking at, who are, who are other artists invested in, who are they excited by? And I think, you know, different spaces have allowed you to um, not crowdsource, but just have a wider um, input on the people that you work with. You know, artists are really supporting each other in a, in a I think, really unique, well, maybe you can, you can weigh in on this practically, um, but in a very different way where it's kind of, you know, people say, have you seen this? Have you seen this? I work with them. I did this. Or that support is also, I think, incredibly encouraging because then you're also able to talk to people about how it was to work with that person or, you know, what ideas came up through a practice or what a collaborative model might look like. But also, I think it's meaning that hopefully we can also support more people because we can also see more, you know, there's more visibility of artists when I think at one point that was very, it can still be super overwhelming. It's also exciting to see how can we create infrastructures or create exhibitions or create whatever that supports the development of more people and more growth yeah. alongside each other as a kind of growing community. Um, whether that's kind of schooling and teaching and uh, tooling up each other uh, on a kind of like, I guess like pedagogy level or whether or not that's just having like quicker critique, not quicker, but more, um, yeah, more open access to critique and, and each other's work. So I don't know if, you know, I do still do like traditional, I hate this word, studio visits um, and all of this, but I think it's just having a wider knowledge that there is so much out there and that's exciting. Yeah. Melanie, what about you? Um, I guess it's something we grapple with all the time, thinking about how do we engage, how, we, how are we ensuring that there's, that we engage with different artists and we engage with different audiences and that we're current and relevant, as well as acknowledging that we have a historical collection, which we also um, requires, and it's a collection and it's a permanent collection, which is slightly different to other forms of engagement, whether that's commissions or, um, yeah, because there's lots of different ways we, well, the museum works with digital in looser sense artists. Um, and I think, the way that we do that is by working collaboratively as a team so it's not just one individual uh, coming to this with one idea um, so that we kind of try to reflect lots of different um, perspectives in terms of who we work with where we should be looking 
Um, lots more still can be done. I don't think we have the answer to that now, but it, at least it's something that we're conscious of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. William, how about you though? I mean, you mentioned earlier you you grew up going to museums, things, um, and that's kind of informed most of your practice, um, going seeing physical exhibitions. But now, I mean, especially if you're sort of, I, I, I've joined a Twitter account since I've joined Verse. Um, how much, are, like, where do you look at art? How important is it to you still? And how do you feel about looking at it on your, you know, absorbing all these visuals on your phone opposed to seeing physical? Do you feel like both are important? Do you try to protect yourself from one or the other? Um, You're pretty good about it, actually. You don't obsess. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think what's important is the native medium of the art piece. If uh, an art piece was made to be exhibited between four walls, you have to go there to see it. If it, uh, it, has, if it has been made for digital consumption, see it that way. Uh, it is native medium. I think there's no other choice. Uh, just listen to the artist. What was the message? What was what was it or her trying to, who she was trying to, to say with this piece. But I don't see any, any problem with that. Uh, yeah, just, just choose a native medium. I think it's a simple question, actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you say it's a simple question, but I found putting this exhibition together really hard, which sounds crazy, because everybody will say, well, they, you just put some pictures somewhere. But I find it's harder with digital, since, since I've yeah. been in the digital medium, it's really hard because my first impression of it is on my laptop, yeah. on my phone. And I was saying this earlier on a call to Tamara and Melanie that really when you work as a curator, you're so used to being physically around the work in terms of how you feel around it, in terms of how it changes the room. And, all these physical elements you don't you don't take into account because you just see it in one format and now i have the responsibility of turning this into an exhibition and really bringing out doing your work justice um, and making sure that i can spread that message to a wider audience um, i would love to hear from both of you actually because you work regularly i mean you display your um, permanent collection quite a lot Sadly, we don't, but I, I mean, I wish we <laughs> did, bit. but currently there is on display some work. So yes, a little so plug goes into the budget prints, but um, thinking about digital resolution in prints, actually a lot of the work that we have are works on paper and um, there are lots of different ways to think about digital. Um, um, digital print is one of them. And actually, even though it seems um, an antiquated way of thinking about it, it still offers a very, um, an outlet, an output, that many artists still turn to, which is true to their work, because it offers a, like, a, a wide range of um, possibilities that aren't always actually possible on a screen. So I don't actually see there being a contradiction. I, n not to say that one is better than the other, there's scope for yeah. both, but um, yeah, we work with a lot of works on paper as well as other uh, ways of encountering works. Um, yeah. But I do agree that when the piece changes medium, yeah. It becomes difficult because yeah. it's not the native medium. Yeah, this yeah. piece is, but this, this is, these ones were made for prints. Yes. So it was easier for, I think this one was, were easier, but this one were like native, that digi digital native. So yes. it's way harder to translate all I had to say yeah. with a print because you lose information, basically. You lose information. You do lose information. It's like the same when you, photograph a painting, you lose information. It goes both ways. Um, so yeah, when you want to exhibit something or change medium or change bubble, this is where the hard part starts. And people have a preconception of it. I think one of the visitors was saying, oh, I imagine these ones were small, the other ones were big. It's <laughs> because everybody has their own imagination. Um, Tamar, you work on pretty complex installations though for digital art. How, how does that work? I mean, um, I'm just reminded of a really funny, when we were kind of trying to, you know, we're building this game and we knew that we were going to be doing an exhibition. So um, it made me, it's like a recurring thing that makes me laugh that we'd always be saying, you know, watch, you know, let's, I'd say like, Gabrielle, just like do a sketch, just like the sketch, something like what is in your head? 
and they'd hated, they just would not draw at all. They'd go straight to Blender and they'd be like, just draw a sketch, please, just, just do, just please, like, here's a pencil. But they felt so uncomfortable with that medium that their mind automatically went into, you know, Blender. I would, you know, they'd prefer to just sculpt everything rather than kind of um, have that, that, I suppose, like initial translation that wasn't right for them. So for us, I think a big challenge, and for Gabriel, a big challenge was doing that. You know, they are digital native in that sense. And it was a big challenge to figure out what does that look like and how do you reckon with space or physical space? Whereas I suppose in, you know, in a game world, um, uh, in Unreal Engine, for example, that we built the game in, you know, physics are their own thing. You, you have to reckon with, you know, very different physics and the, the real world, inverted commas. But increasingly, I think we're really excited about what is this kind of mixed reality um, possibilities that, you know, working with a, an artist that works through digital technologies, what is the new kind of possibilities of putting your body in the, because as an exhibition, primarily your body is in a space. What does that mean with how you encounter an artwork, the differences of which you can encounter an artwork? And I think you have to, again, why it's exciting to kind of come back to this notion of intimacy is because you are a body in a space at that point. Um, and that is, I think, is the, the kind of first question that should always reckon with anything. You know, these are, you have a very bodily relationship with them because of the size, for example, of these. And that is like, obviously something that was important for you in that sense. And you can't translate in the same way as on a screen versus if you're working with, I don't know, 4K files and then you're talking about resolution, it's a different conversation, but what is it to also create uh, an environment um, that allows your body to kind of swim through or experience a narrative or a experience in a, yeah, in a bodily sense. So for us, I think translating the game, for example, we were keen to make sure that there were different ways to play. So, you know, Gabrielle is primarily, they're very interested in texture and um, archiving texture and all of this. So the space is very tactile, actually. There's like furry game chairs and um, the, the light and the sound slowly changes and you're, you kind of have a bit of a jolt when you go in because you're entering this kind of space of change um, and of growth. And for them, they really wanted to take advantage of the fact that you, yeah, you are a body in a space. So I think that's something that I'm excited to kind of reckon with. Increasingly, our artists, um, people like Daniel Brathwaite Shirley, he's another artist that we work with, for instance, um, her practice is all about what does it mean to have someone recognise and register their presence, first of all, in, uh, in conjunction with the artwork, and how does that change the artwork and the experience? Cool. Well, before I open up, to the audience for questions <laughs> where the real questions are coming in what's next for you william uh less work <laughs> less work and more more physical i think because all these years i think i i sharpened my digital skills it's very sharpened now i, I can go I don't know everything in the coding, you know, world, but I know I could, I could, how to say, like, teach myself. From that point, I can teach myself anything. I think. Uh, but with physical, I'm way behind. Mm -hmm. If I want to keep to keep evolving, whatever I'm doing, I need to raise my physical practice as well. So I think more physical will come next year. Um, and you're quite religious about it. Like you practice every day. Yeah. You sketch, you paint. I just you don't you take show people because it's awful. <laughs> well, that's it, it's. But uh, yeah, I practice. I'm there. Believe me, I'm there every morning. But it takes time, I think. Like traditional, any practice actually, not traditional or digital. Any practice takes time. I spent 12 years coding and only like four or five painting. So there is a gap between the both. Yeah. I want to, yeah, to level everything. Well, I feel like that's what you're doing with the series as well. I mean, they're really overlapping. And you spoke about this earlier, how, how your physical practice, how you use the brush and the pen influences how you code um, for your, you know, in, in terms of your digital work. Um, I think it's evolving very nicely. I love how like dedicated you are and you're doing it religiously and you're doing it every day. 
and I'm excited to see where you take it. And do you do it because you'd like to lose yourself in it? Because you said you're just doing it to get better, but I feel like you also enjoy getting yeah. lost in it. Because whenever I ask you for a question, you're like, let me go painting, I'll get back to you after I finish my painting. So do you, is it a little bit um, of that too? I feel that the digital space is going too fast. And for me, painting is a way to slow down everything. It just, I don't even have internet in my studio. Like, I made right. a choice with, so that's why I don't answer your message. No, it's good. <laughs> I don't have internet, actually. But, yeah, for me, it's, it's like, it's a safe space. I just, my, my thoughts are only, even my body is turned towards something I'm making with my hands. Uh, it feels different. I want to explore that, and I also want to import what I know from the software, from the computational algorithm space, import it in my physical, so the other way around, and see what happens. Um, maybe I will break my wrist, maybe. But um, I don't know, I want to explore that as well. Right, what's next for you? Melanie, in terms of expanding the collection, looking at more digital art, what's what's happening in the V&A? Um, or shall we okay. look out for? Okay, so uh, currently working, co-editing a book about um, histories and contemporary practices um, across, um, yeah, different geographic locations and um, involving um, artists um, both in the collection and outside. Um, this is what's consuming most of my headspace at the moment. Um, in terms of the collection, um, I guess consolidating what we have, finding gaps, what we don't have, filling those gaps, and also looking to where, um, yeah, and thinking about contemporary uh, collecting as well is something that um, cannot devolve names at the moment, but this is something that we continually um, explore and think about, so yeah. Um, we have a um, conference coming up called Cultures of Ownership. Um, as part of what we do, we look a lot at different kind of ownership structures that are emerging through um, artists working with technologies or just um, different infrastructures. So we have that coming up in November, um, which is going to bring together a lot of different research and practitioners in the space. And then me, myself, uh, I'm going to start doing some new commissions. So. Exciting. Exciting. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm very grateful. And I'd love to open up questions um, to... There we go. Uh, I have a slightly contrary way to what you guys were talking about, so I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say. So I'm actually under the notion that I think sometimes it's important to highlight that this particular art collection is a digital art collection. And the reason I say that is I believe there are certain struggles and, and issues that these artists go through that are nuanced to being a digital artist rather than just being an artist. And if we don't highlight these, we're not going to educate because this is the same argument we make when we're talking about, let's say, diversity. Because if you're not, like, and that's why we're trying to be like, no, oh, you know, we want, we want Asian representation or we want Middle Eastern representation. And it's important to highlight that because these institutions, these structures are still controlled by a certain box of rules and whatever like people thought to design them think that so do you not think that sometimes it's actually important to highlight that so that one day we can change these notions so that eventually over time you can be just an artist regardless of, of the medium that you choose yeah i think it's important but not to the extent that it's restrictive so that it's used with an understanding of what digital can mean and it's not defined in one restrictive way so yeah when we talk about it there could be a number of things how we how we think about what digital can can be but yeah it's an interesting question like terminology changes all the time and i usually do have a caveat when i immediately say i'm a curative digital art what i understand by digital to mean but um yeah i think it's important to acknowledge at this stage but also with that goes hand in hand that it doesn't just mean thinking in one way, working in one way, um, and also acknowledge that some people don't want to be um, credited or acknowledged in that way and to respect that equally. So, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes it's something that, you know, for on an institutional side or um, practicality side in terms of like facilitating and facilitation and saying what you need, what you want, how can we make 
you know, your working practice better? How can we better facilitate you to grow as an artist? Definitely it is, you know, essential to make sure that you're having those conversations and archiving that and, you know, paying that forward in terms of reports or, you know, feeding into different, you know, different um, spaces like this, for example, that are kind of focused on, yeah, you know, are kind of focused on more specifically. So I don't, I don't think, I wouldn't say that you, um, you definitely have to pay attention to it and you definitely have to make sure that you're doing that diligence of work to until the, the, the labels come down. But I think an artist is very well within their rights to say, I don't want to be defined within this box. But coming from a curatorial perspective or, um, you know, as a facilitator, cura you know, curator comes from the Latin, which means cura, curator or cura. Always, I'm forgetting, isn't it? My Latin's terrible. Um, but means to care. So that is the same... Um, that is the underpinning of everything we do. And if we don't understand the requirements, necessities and the specificities of what these artists need, then of course, we're not gonna be able to push things forward. I wanted to hear all four of your thoughts on like, the process, because I think often today, specifically with generative art, it's really hard for like, the layman to understand the process and the technical capability that goes into this artwork and how should we be framing those conversations like are they important to artists to talk about like this is my methods and this is how I want it to be talked about in an artistic manner and how important is that to, like, to an institutional level and then to a dealer level as well like, communicating that to an audience maybe it's the first time like meeting this art. I really, I, for me, we have this conversation a lot um, amongst the team and I think we have quite divided opinions about it. For me, it goes back to the same conversation, artist is an artist. I really couldn't, I, for me, it's not at all about technical ability, though I intuitively pick up that this is done very well. It's just like looking at a painting, I know it's done well, but it's more than that that interests me. So for me, technicality is absolutely not of importance. Though, of course, I mean, I know he's an amazing, yeah, in, in William's instance, he's an incredible <laughs> pioneer. No, he's, of course, that is, that is very important. But it's for me definitely not the first thing I look at. I look really more as an artist in a more holistic, oh, like what is there generally? What do they generally want to do? How do I see them? I get more excited about artists where I feel like they actually want to just starting to develop they're, they're onto something and they want to see this go further. Like for me, that's exciting to be on a journey on that with them um, in terms of how they conceptually and, um, and also within their practice develop their work. But I'm curious to hear how you guys feel yeah, about it. I mean, I yeah, <laughs> I guess I also, not exactly speaking on behalf of the v &A, but it's important to emphasize the v &A is a museum of process. So we're really interested in processes. That's not to say, though, like, how does that weigh with um, the output? And actually, very much thinking about generative art, it's very much outputs when we're thinking about seriality, although obviously there are individual works as well, but I often think about generative and, like, series of works. Um, I think it's important, very important to understand how a work is made um, and to communicate that. It's important for a curator and it's important for curators to, exp like, to not explain, but, like, yeah, to put that information out there for the public, but not necessarily of equal weight when showing the artwork as well. I don't feel like it's not a lesson in how is this work made. I think you lose something by becoming a bit too, um, yeah, didactic in terms of like laying exactly how it was made. But I think it's having an understanding of the material and the skill set and, and how that work is actually made is pretty integral to an appreciation of the art. Maybe we put it like that. That's just my perspective. I think it thoughts? depends what you want to do. I mean, within Arts Tech, one of our big things is also developing like advanced production capabilities. So, for example, with the game, um, we were producing it in house. We bought production in house, so every single day we were building it with the artists. We, it was important for us that we knew what that workflow is. You know how everyone's, um, how each of you know the, how the animator spoke to the developers, how everything. Um, worked, what happens when Gabrielle developed the assets and then what happened from that point on because also that means that you're able to kind of advocate for um, you know more money for example or, or longer time periods to develop something if you don't know how it's made you can't do that so for us it's really important um, just on a practical level 
um, that we do, I know how to do things. I think a lot of the people within Arts Tech come from uh, whether we're not an artist background or um, we have someone that comes from a legal background, we have someone that comes from a design background and we're all very much want to be involved in the process. I think differently to um, maybe, yeah, wider within the Serpentine or other arts organisations, we really do put our producers on the same level as our curators. If that makes it, it should be like that because they, we can't do it without them. They can't, you know, it, it needs to be that conversation and equally we want to grow and understand with our artists. We are artist led, which means that if we don't know how the artist is working, why they're working like that, how we can kind of help them to maybe optimise their process even, all of these things are really important to us. I'd like to just follow up by saying, of course, I need I need to know how the process works and it's how too late, it is. It's too late, yeah. But <laughs> I don't know anything. You're there. But no, but for me, it's definitely not a make or break it for me. Like it, it's not. It's it's. There's a lot more that interests me than the technicality. Um, I guess artist. I'd also add, like, it depends, like, there are different levels of, like, knowledge. I mean, for as an institution, if we're acquiring a work, then there's from a conservation point of view, we also need to understand, yeah. we understand how it's made. But then when we think about interpretation and how we might share that with the public, I wouldn't necessarily put, like, the code, although this was a question with the Casey Reese that we acquired in 2010, should the code be put up as part of the label? I don't win that argument. Um, and it's interesting now to, like, reflect back on 10 years whether, you know, how we described it, would it be interesting to have put Did that? Did you display but, it? Oh yeah, it's on permanent display, yeah. but the label um, is written in um, uh, English, in language, um, rather than the actual code which right, for the that's, work that's to put parallel. So yeah, I, I don't, what do I think? I think that there's a difference in terms of layers of information. It's incredibly important to know how the work is made, but how yeah. you communicate that and yeah. who, you who you communicate it with yeah. differs depending on who you're talking to. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, on my side, I would say I'm trying to make stuff that can be read by many people. So I want to have all the conversation, not only one. The process is important, especially with generative art, but sometimes I think there is a strong emphasis on this only, on how it is made, the technical set, uh, it is made with this crazy computer and crazy technology, so it's good. And sometimes no, it's no. Uh, I think that's how, that's also, I think especially with generative art, is how you place it with this whole ecosystem of art. Is it a subset or is it something else, like a sub-movement, or if it's art, then it had to be correlated to art. And for me, generative art is a way to, to talk. It's a language. It's not, making the algorithm is not the end. It's a way of getting to my message. So the process is important, but it's not the end, I think. The end is, if I succeeded to say what I wanted to say. Uh, but of course there is this, the nerds, you know, and we, he, we, and we can talk about processes and I'll be happy to, but it's not only about that, I think. I think it also comes down a little bit to um, like public responsibility in a sense, depending on where you work. So we, we do a lot of work in kind of trying to reveal a bit more of the back end of what we do. Um, purely, you know, in the past couple of years, it, there was a lot of, you know, interest in the technology field, but a lot of, we had a bit of a struggle with, even within the organisation of people saying, we understand that you do so much work, you do all of these publications, you do, but we don't understand it. So, you know, even in terms of making the transition to um, onboarding, I suppose, the rest of the organisation and saying, um, and our audiences who want to know, like, how do I get into this or how do I, how do I become, you know, more involved in this space that I want to be, but I don't really get it. And from an institutional level, you do have that responsibility also to kind of help steward your audiences or help, you know, onboard your audiences to what you're doing and, um, I suppose, removing the layer of... Uh, but my counter argument is that when there is too much talk about process, you lose an audience because then I feel removed from it because I just respond to the work and as a process, as, uh, yeah, as a process and in relation to other works, probably. Um, so, 
Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting conversation because it's obviously really important and integral, but we don't ever talk about processes of painters. You know, there might be a painter who we do. uses... <laughs> I know, but not not in general, yeah, like no, as I a know. general. Yes, of course you do. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I think it's yeah, it is definitely an interesting question because it is integral to the work. No, so. I, I like I like to sit with other artistic practices like yeah. dancing or singing. The first thing you see or feel is not the process; is the whole message. Mm -hmm. And I I like to sit like that. When something is so good, you're like, oh my God, it's so good. I'm going to dig into the process. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That's usually what happens. That's right. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I had a question for William. Um, you, you, met, you spoke about your physical practice and your digital practice. I was just curious as to what extent they overlap. So historically, there are examples of like Harold Cohen with Aaron, where there was a period where he would sort of refined and finished, it almost didn't feel complete to him and he had to insert part of himself. Is that something you've experienced? I, I thought it was interesting that you described the algorithm, so like, I made it, it's like my child. And it made me think, you know, with, with children, sometimes you want to correct things, but you shouldn't, they have to learn themselves. And does that create like a feedback loop where you go back to the algorithm and you try and refine it? Yeah, uh, I definitely think as adults, we lose creativity, we lose freedom. Now I have a two years old myself and so I just put some crayons into his hands. I'm like, okay, do your thing now. And he's like, and I'm like, that's good. And I'm fascinated how the human can be intuitively creative. Uh, and I'm trying to find this back and that's why I'm moving uh, back and forth between the physical and the code to just try a way to break free and not be confined by what I was told to do uh, or what was good or not good. Um, so yeah, the, the, the relationship with my physical and digital practice is very, the, the, the basic, the base, the plate is, is me. Uh, these are just part of me, but there's me beneath. So that's what I'm trying to dig. Any other qu last question? No? Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening, Tamar, Melanie, and William. It's been lovely speaking to you both, and thank you to everyone who made it this evening. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.